I think that many people want to be happy. I know I do. But what does that really mean? And what is it? And, and where do we find it? Today, we're beginning a new sermon series based on a book by Matt Miofsky, United Methodist pastor in St. Louis, and it's focused on this message, this idea of happiness. And, and first, I want to clarify something to say I'm not talking about temporary feelings here. We all have good days and bad days. We're happy sometimes. We're sad other times. I'm talking about that more profound and longer lasting feeling, an abiding peace and satisfaction and purpose and joy that sometimes can seem elusive. Second, you can find thousands of books and blogs and videos and lectures and podcasts about happiness. It's very easy to find if you search online. In fact, if you mention the topic to someone else, almost everyone has a book recommendation, a video to watch, a podcast to listen to, a study to consider. And we're not going to just take a look at the popular wisdom about joy. We're going to take a look and see what the Scripture has to say about it. And as we saw in this beginning, the Bible has a lot to say say about happiness. But before we get to Scripture, I do want to take one closer look at a, a bit of science and a study on the subject of happiness. Maybe you've heard of the Harvard Study of Adult Development. It started in 1938. Um, and it followed 238 Harvard undergraduate students. And they measured an, just an incredible number of life factors from physical to physiological to financial. And the goal was simple and ambitious. They wanted to figure out what actually makes people happy. It is the longest and most comprehensive study on happiness ever conducted. Um, the lead investigator, Robert, Dr. Robert Waldinger, is the fourth leader to follow these men. They were first men and later added women to the study from the time they were young to the time that they were old. And the study is focused on testing and verifying what made them happy versus what they thought might make them happy. You see, each generation speculates on what's going to bring happiness, and this generation is no different. We all have life goals. We all have some ideas about what might make us happy. And, and for example, Dr. Waldinger writes this. There was a recent survey of millennials asking them what their most important life goals were. Over 80% said that a major life goal for them was to get rich. Sounds pretty good. And another 50% of those same young adults said that another major life goal was to become famous. Another possible life goal. And we're constantly told to lean into work, to push harder, and to achieve more. We're given the impression that these are the things that we need to go after in order to have a good life. Now, what's great about this study is that it doesn't tell us just what makes for lasting happiness. It also tells us what doesn't. So in the study, how do people's goals work out? 75 years later, have they brought happiness? If they could go back and do it over again, would they do anything differently? We'll come back to that at the end of the sermon. But before we get there, I want to talk about a different study this one conducted a little bit further back in time, and we find it in the book of Ecclesiastes. Nearly 3,000 years before this study, a uh, Harvard study, someone else did a similar study, but it didn't study other people, instead paying attention to one's self. And the, the writer tried a bunch of different things to see what would make him happy. And then, when he was done, wrote down his findings in a book. And we call that book Ecclesiastes. It's part of the Old Testament, um, the Hebrew Bible. The word Ecclesiastes, when translated from Hebrew, means teacher. And the book is about a man, the teacher, who decides to conduct a lifelong experiment on happiness and meaning. Now, tradition tells us that the teacher, that the author of this book, is King Solomon. In fact, one legend is that King Solomon wrote the Song of Solomon as a young man. You remember, this is a book of love poetry. Proverbs as a middle-aged person, a practical and efficient book of wisdom. And then Ecclesiastes as an older adult, reflecting on all that he had learned about life. It's kind of a memoir. It is reflecting back on life. It tells the story of Solomon's journey. He set out to learn what life was all about and what made him happy. 
Solomon's approach was to take a look at some things and get rid of the myths uh, that we chase that don't lead to lasting happiness, perhaps in a similar way to that Harvard experiment. So let's take a look at the book of Ecclesiastes, and as we might do with any scientific study, we'll look at some of Solomon's hypotheses and his conclusions. Okay, so we're trying to find lasting happiness. How are we going to go about it? What are we going to try first? How about work? What you do for a living? If I find meaningful work, that will give me lasting happiness, won't it? Let's see what Solomon found in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. He writes this, I hated the things I worked so hard for here under the sun because I will have to leave them to someone who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Either way, that person will have control over the results of all my hard work and wisdom here under the sun. That too is pointless. I mean, what do people get for all their hard work and struggles under the sun? All their days are pain and their work is aggravation. Even at night, their hearts don't find rest. This too is pointless. So what is Solomon's conclusion about work? It's not going to work to make you happy. Work cannot make you happy because one day it ends. And when it does, no one remembers and no one cares. They uh, pass on to the next person in your role and and tend to forget perhaps what it was that you spent all your time on. So work, well, maybe that's not going to work, but what's next? What are we going to consider next? How about stuff? Surely things, uh, accumulating stuff can make us happy. Money, possessions, achievements, power, these are all possibilities. Let's see what Solomon found in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Verse 10 and 11 says this, the money lover isn't satisfied with money, neither is the lover of wealth satisfied with income. This too is pointless. When good things flow, so do those who consume them. But what do owners benefit from such goods except to feast their eyes on them? And then in verse 15, just as they come from their mother's womb naked, naked they'll return, ending up just like they started. Our the hard work produces nothing, nothing they can take with them. So what's Solomon's conclusion about stuff? Well, we can accumulate possessions, but they don't benefit us, and we can't take them with us. As for achievements, we can't accomplish enough to satisfy the longing for something more. And no matter how great we are, there is always someone who's better. Okay, so work and stuff, those are out. What's left? Uh, What's next? Well, Solomon says, well, how about pleasure? Let me just enjoy myself. Surely that will make me happy. But but Ecclesiastes 2 says this, I I said to myself, come, I will make you experience pleasure. Enjoy what is good. But this too was pointless. Merriment, I thought, is madness. Pleasure of no use at all. I tried cheering myself with wine and by embracing folly, with wisdom still guiding me, he adds, until I might see what is really worth doing in the few days that human beings have under heaven. So what does Solomon think about pleasure? There aren't enough parties in the world, people to sleep with or bottles of wine to cover up the longing that we feel for something significant and something more. So work, accumulation, stuff, pleasure, these things don't make us happy. So what did Solomon finally have to say about happiness? What did he learn from his study? Well, we see this in chapter 1, verse 2, Solomon's conclusion. Perfectly pointless, says the teacher. Perfectly pointless. Everything is pointless. In other words, as a result of study, uh, Solomon's grand study, the conclusion that he came for is, wait for it, Nothing will make you happy. And I know what you must be saying. This is it? This is what you're going to leave me with? Uh, Nothing makes us happy? It's just a little bit depressing, isn't it? But uh, nothing can make us happy. It seems like that for Solomon. but, But is that the end of the story? Well, it's not quite the end of the story. Because stay with it. Nothing makes us happy. Nothing makes us happy. No thing makes us happy. No thing makes us happy. You see, there's a profound truth in Solomon's conclusion. He hints at it later in the book of Ecclesiastes. 
After repeating his observation that many things in life are pointless, he goes on to say this in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their hard work. If either should fall, one can pick up the other. But how miserable are those who fall and don't have a companion to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they can stay warm, but how can anyone stay warm alone? Also, one can be overpowered, but two together can put up resistance. A three-ply cord doesn't easily snap. While the teacher goes to great lengths to show us that no thing makes us happy, Solomon gives us some hints about where happiness lies. And it isn't in something. It's in relationships. Solomon tells us that two are better than one and a three-ply cord doesn't easily snap. No thing can make us happy, but relationships can. It's what Jesus taught many years later, and it constitutes one of the simplest and most profound messages of Scripture. Things don't make for lasting happiness. Relationships do. The starting point for lasting happiness is in relationships, and not just any kind of relationships, but three specific kinds of relationships. Jesus himself summed it up for us. Somebody was asking him what the meaning of everything in the Old Testament was. What's the meaning of the law and the prophets? And if you had to boil it all down, what's the point of this whole thing? What would you say? And here's what Jesus said. It's recorded in three of the Gospels, though this version happens to be from Matthew. He replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You must love your neighbor as you love yourself. Did you hear those three relationships? Do you see them? Do you want to know what makes for lasting happiness, abiding peace and joy? Well, Jesus taught us that it's no thing. And the good news is that lasting happiness can be found in relationships with God, with ourselves, and with other people. It's that simple. Now, I'm sure some of you are skeptics, perhaps, and maybe aren't buying it. So I want to come back to that other study that we took a look at at the beginning of uh, the message today, the Harvard study. Do you want to know what Dr. Waldinger and his colleagues found after decades of research, after millions of dollars, and after thousands of hours of study? Here's, Here's what he wrote. What are the lessons that come from the tens of thousands of pages of information that we've generated on these lives Well, the lessons aren't about wealth or fame or working harder and harder. The clearest message that we get from this 75-year study is this. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. So here's your challenge. To the extent that you're investing your time and money and energy in things, know that they might contribute to your happiness, but by themselves, they won't enable you to achieve it. Instead, all of us might consider how do we invest every minute of every hour in good relationships with God, with other people, and with ourselves, because those are the things that will bring us lasting happiness. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, you know that each of us carries different things in our lives. You know where we're looking, what we're chasing in our search for happiness. And so, God, we ask that you help us to listen to the wisdom of so many who have come before us, who remind us it's not money or work or power or having fun that matters. Instead, help us invest in good relationships May your Holy Spirit fill us with the wisdom to listen and to learn and to live out of the truth that you teach us. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.